welcome back to Something's Happening Here. I'm Steve Hicks, the Director of Podcast Ministries for Talking Donkey International, and today is Friday, if you are watching this in real time. Um, tomorrow is New Year's Eve, so this is our last broadcast of 2022, and thank you for being part of this experiment uh, so far. We pray that you'll be with us for a long time, and your support will help us get the gospel message to a greater number of people still. Let's make sure you're subscribed. So on Facebook, that means liking this page and changing your notifications according to the instructions in the comments under this video. If you're on YouTube, that means hit your subscribe button and also the notifications bell so that we show up in your subscription feed. Uh, if you're on Talking Donkey International, go to the podcast page and bookmark it. And that way, uh, that will tide you over until we have a more formal subscription there. Well, again, welcome. Today is Friday, which means we have arrived at the culmination of our episode this week, uh, titled Hiding in Plain Sight. So we are going to look at something that links together all of the ideas we have shared so far. And we're going to do it prophetically speaking out of the Old Testament book of Daniel chapter 11. Now, if you have been watching along uh, over the weeks that we've been doing this, you will probably hear Daniel 11 as a familiar chapter because I talk about it a lot. And the reason that I talk about it a lot is because I believe that is the prophecy for right now, that it, 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 it describes our moment in time and what is still to come. So that's where we're going to end up today. And in terms of an article to look at today, I am looking at BibleAsk.org. And uh, the question being asked is, who is the king of the south, according to Daniel 11? Now, I'll just tell you from the beginning, there are as many different understandings of Daniel 11 as there are human beings trying to explain it. So most of the time when you run into something on the internet, on this topic, it's going to be, well, it's going to be wrong. <laughs> if you understand my, if you believe that my understanding is the correct one, then, you know, you're going to be reading a bunch of wrong stuff. This particular article, which was not written by me, but it could have been in terms of how close it is to my understanding of Daniel 11, I think this does a really good job. And so I want to read what this article claims about the king of the south. It's right here. Fulfillment of the prophecy at the end of time, the anti-type. And what that means is, anti-type means... Um, type and anti-type are a prophetic series of terms. And what it means is like the, the prophecy has some sort of type or, or like a prototype, you know, where it exists in a small form or a, a localized fulfillment in time. But the anti-type would be the final, fullest fulfillment of that thing. And so type and anti-type are at work here in Daniel 11 in terms of um, the, the original types of the kings of the north and south are found in the real life Greek kings of the Ptolemaic and Seleucid empires. <laughs> if you don't know your history, those words don't mean anything to you. But if you know your Greek history, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. And you can literally identify like these real human kings at play in the earlier verses of this chapter. But the kings of the north and south remain in the prophecy well after those individual people died well after the Greek empire collapses. And so clearly those individual kings are not the fullest anti-type of the prophecy. They're just the original types. We are looking for the anti-type, the fullness of what it means at the very end. And that's what this article is going to tell us. I'm just going to read these three paragraphs. Uh, the king of the north at the end of time would be spiritual Babylon, out of Revelation 17 and 18. Reformers and Bible scholars of ages past have identified the king of the north with the Roman Catholic system or the papacy. And then there's a little link there if you wanted to go into that more in more detail. This system will be a religio-political system 
that would attempt to force God's people to worship according to its dictates, as ancient Babylon tried to force the Hebrews to worship according to its dictates. The king of the south, geographically Egypt, did not acknowledge Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh, for anyone who's not familiar, is like the formal name of God given in the scriptures. Um, it's a four-letter word in Hebrew, Y-H-W-H, and I've never actually seen it spelled this way, J-A-H-W-E, but it's talking about that same thing, the Yahweh full name of God, and Egypt did not acknowledge it. For Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And he enslaved the Hebrews and didn't, and did not give them the right to worship their God according to their conscience. However, he did not force them to worship Egyptian deities. Therefore, the spiritual king of the south at the end of time will be secularism. I agree with that. But I don't really love the explanation given in this article. I, I understand why they took this approach, because it can be complicated and wonky <laughs> to kind of wrestle it out from the prophecy itself. Um, but I just, I think that's what we should do. Because even though I agree with the conclusion, it's not a convincing argument that leads me to that conclusion. So I do fully believe that the king of the south at the end of time is, in the prophecy, is less so a specific person or entity and is more so this kind of spirit of secularism that just advances all over the place. And it takes a number of different practical forms in the real world. If we, if we accept that premise, then I hope you see how that's the thing that's been hiding in plain sight. It's the thing that links together everything we talked about Monday through Thursday of this week. It's secular ideas that brought us futurism as a theology in the first place, right? Because, again, the Council of Trent in the 1500s was convened because the Protestants were going to their Bibles and saying, we only accept what's in the Bible. We only accept these divine things. The Catholic system at the time had a lot that was part of it that did not come from the Bible, and so they formed this council to like undo the work that was being done by the Protestant Reformation. In other words, to introduce its own secular ideas to undo the divine ideas of the Protestant Reformation. Um, it was, it's clearly secular ideas that creep into an understanding of the plain words of the Bible that lead to alleged experts of the Bible telling us that the <laughs> that the, the water in the Euphrates River lessening over time is somehow the fulfillment of Revelation 16. It's clearly not. It is secularism advancing that is, is how Satan is getting into our public schools under quite literally the, the guise of rationale and tolerance, these secular ideas. And, and of course... Yesterday's article, this unhinged woman going to war about a Christmas tree, that's all about secular ideas. Her religion is secularism. So we can see if the king of the south truly is the embodiment of secularism on like the militaristic march, we, can, we see evidence of that all over, all over the place, inside the church and out. And I want to go to Daniel 11 and do a better job of trying to demonstrate and prove that the king of the south is, in fact, secularism. Um, if we don't accept that and we keep looking for an individual or an organization or a company or a government, I think we're going to be led astray. And maybe we'll find like one specific instance of the king of the south on a rampage, but we're going to miss the full picture of it. I really think it's necessary to understand the fullness of the king of the south and of the north as their respective spiritual ideas more so than people or organizations. So in Daniel 11, I'm picking up the story in verse 40, because that's where I believe we are right now. And it says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, 
and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Again, you probably recognize that verse. We've talked about it a lot, and we're likely to talk about it a lot more. <laughs> this verse sets up a conflict between these two characters, king of the north and south. And the time frame for this battle is said to be the time of the end. So, what does that mean? Go to the following chapter, chapter 12. And there's a question asked in verse 6. Daniel the prophet is looking at this scene, and there's an angelic being who's there. And Daniel asks, well, Daniel doesn't ask, there's two of these um, angelic beings, and one of them asks the other one at the end of verse 6, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? These wonders are referring to what Daniel saw in vision in chapters 7 and 8 and 9 and 11. So how long till all these things come to pass? Verse 7 is a, a bunch of other details that are not the answer, um, but verse now, well, the second half of verse 7 has the answer. That it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Hey, we talked about time, times, and half a time, didn't we? Earlier this week. That is one of the one of the uh, time frames given for that 42-month same period of time, that three and a half years, time, times, and a half a time. It's all referring to the same body of time. You're going to have to take my word for it because we don't have time to fully flesh that out. But when we study that same phrase, time, times, and a half a time, from Daniel chapter 7, we can, we can wrestle out the idea that it refers to a 1,260-year period, literal period in history, that stretches from roughly 508 A.D. until roughly 1798 A.D. 508 is when the sitting pope gave um, Clovis the Franc, the leader of the Franc people, uh, the authority to act in his name. And so the French, there was no France at the time, but the, the precursor of the French army was now operating under the banner of the papacy and, and God. 1798 was the context of the French Revolution when the power of the state was stripped from the Catholic Church. And so isn't that interesting that France was on both ends of that? France kind of gave the power of the state to the church, and France took the power of the state away from the church <laughs> with 1,260 years in between. So, <clears throat> so the answer to when will all of these prophecies come to pass is at the time, times, and half a time when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. And so if the conclusion of that time period is 1798, the context of the French Revolution, the French Revolution was a war against God. The, the more you study it, the clearer it really is. It was the left, the secularists and the humanists, versus the right, the loyalists to the church. That's actually where those terms come from. It was the French Revolution gave us the left and the right. So that's the time of the end, right? The French Revolution. And so back to chapter 11, verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south goes on his rampage, and then the king of the north responds with an even bigger rampage. So we see that clearly fulfilled in type in the French Revolution, the secular humanists up against the traditional religionists, right? The left versus the right. The left strikes and seems to be successful for a, a few years, but ultimately, if you know your history, the church struck back and France did not become a secular nation. It remained a Christian nation up to the present, kind of. 
Um, so that cannot be the full anti-type, but it can point us to the anti-type. The flow of history from 1798 to the present does not match the rest of Daniel 11. That's another clue that there's something greater to reach for. But if we just look at the ideas of the French Revolution, secularism versus religionism, those two ideas have been at war ever since. And at times, one has seemed dominant or the other has seemed dominant. And here we are at the end of 2022, and we are living in perhaps the most dominant secular time of my lifetime, where we don't even pretend to be Christian anymore on a societal level. In fact, Christians are just about the only religious group where it is acceptable and encouraged to persecute and talk trash about in our, in our society today. So we can, I believe that we can see the assault of the King of the South right now in our movies where you'll almost never see anything traditionally religious that is spoken about in a positive way. Or if it's like a Christian movie, most of those movies are really kind of not good. <laughs> if you want to be honest from an artistic point of view, they're really not very good. Uh, we see it from our government that is seems to be specifically against Christians. Um, and this Defense of Marriage Act that just got passed recently um, nods to but never fully delivers on religious exemptions or carve-outs for sincerely held religious beliefs. And so, anyway, I could go on and on and on and on, but I think that we're living in the assault of the King of the South right now which means the counter-assault of the king of the north is coming. The purpose of something's happening here is not just to wake us up to the dangers of the king of the south, but also to plug us into the truth of Jesus Christ as revealed from the pages of scripture because we know someday the king of the north is going to strike back and that's going to be a religionist system. And it's going to be not truth of God that is being crammed down your throat and forced on the whole world. It will be falseness of God crammed down your throat and forced upon the whole world. So we need to not fall into the kind of secular humanist trap of right now, but we have to be equally careful not to fall into the king of the north false religionist trap of what is coming in the future. The only safe place to be in Daniel chapter 11 is with Jesus in verse 22. He is the broken prince hanging on a tree, the lone symbol of righteousness in a fallen world overrun by violence and falsehood. That's where you and I need to be as well. Let us avoid all of the dangers that are hiding in plain sight, right? all of the dangers of secularism and all of the opposite dangers of false religionism. They're all around us. They're in a constant battle that will not end until Jesus comes back. But we can't fall onto either side because neither side is going to win. The winner of chapter 11 here is Jesus Christ. Thank you for hanging out with us all week long as we're talking about this danger hidden in plain sight. I'm sorry we ran a little long today. Um, probably when we talk about heavy prophecy, it'll run a little long, but I'll do my best to keep on the time frame for you guys. In any case, have a good weekend. Let this percolate in your brain for a couple days, and then join us again on Monday in the new year as we start 2023 by looking at, by acknowledging that something's happening here and trying to find Jesus in the middle of it. So God bless you. Happy New Year. And I look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Steve Hicks, and this is Something's Happening Here. God bless.